welcome to the first Birds of a Feather um, and uh, by a C2020 conference. Um, it's going to be about uh, our uh, CDSB community, which stands for the Community of uh, Bike Doctor Software Developers in Spanish. Um, and we're going to talk about our efforts to strengthen the R and Bike Doctor Developer community in Mexico and Latin America, plus show results showcased by the Regu Tools Bike Conductor Package. Um, I put on the chat here the links to the slides and some other um, ways that you can contact us. So, I mean, you can see the slides online. Um, uh, please use the poll section to ask questions and we'll have a Q&A section at the end of this Birds of a Feather. Um, that way uh, we'll go over your questions. Um, and the agenda for this Birds of a Feather is that I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, CDSB and what it is. And then uh, Jocelyn and Carmina and Emiliano are gonna talk about the Regular Tools project. And then Alejandro Reyes is gonna moderate the Q&A section at the end. So uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, um, the CDSB community is part of the Mexican Bioinformatics Network, uh, which uh, their Twitter handle is shown here on the bottom left. Um, and you can find all of our Twitter handles over here in the middle, in that first slide. So uh, CDSB, uh, we first thought about it at a bioconductor conference um, in 2017. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a name for it yet. But uh, we then teamed up with people in Mexico, started the community, and by 2018, by summer 2018, we had our first workshop with support uh, directly from Bioconductor in terms of um, uh, uh, persons. Um, we had Martin Morgan and Benedicton Carvalho um, join as instructors in Mexico, uh, fly to Mexico and teach there for a week. Um, for 2019, uh, we ran a scholarship assistance program or a, a scholarship application assistance program for the BIOSE 2019 conference, uh, trying to help people break barriers. Um, Several of the, uh, we had three members uh, win scholarships um, and attend the conference. Um, and then we taught our first workshop using RCD materials um, um, that we adapted and translated to Spanish. In 2020, uh, we had our first bioconductor package called Regu Tools, which we're, you're gonna hear more about later. Um, and we're planning on teaching a workshop using both materials from our studio and the bioconductor communities. And uh, you can, uh, we have a, a website here that has uh, everything translated in both English and Spanish. How did we get started? Uh, years ago in 20, 2007, Sandrine Dudua, who's one of the Bioconductor founders, uh, visited Mexico. Um, and then she asked this question of who knows about R? And basically no one raised their hand. Um, so we started this education cycle, um, which is, Someone teaches um, in a local community, then members of that local community take the initiative to learn more. And that might involve like going to a conference or things like that. Um, and then ideally, but not always, local members then also teach more local members, right? And that's how you grow your community. Um, uh, and so James Buller, a PhD student in Sandrine Dudouat's lab at the time, uh, came to, to Mexico in January 2008 to teach a one-week intensive course um, such that uh, we would know what R was, right? Um, um, and then in the summer of 2008, uh, we attended our first BIOC conference, Alejandra Medina Rivera and myself. Alejandra is also a CDSB uh, founding uh, member. Um, and so we attended that BIOC conference just to, you know, learn uh, really the basics about R. Um, and then after that, we came back to Mexico and started teaching. And so this was our first course back in um, uh, fall of 2008. And this education cycle has repeated itself many times. Um, now there's some issues with this education cycle. It's really volunteer based, right? It's, um, it really, like the survival of this cycle depends a lot on those local members that um, have the initiative to teach, right? Because Normally, it's not really a paid effort. Um, and so once they leave, it's really hard to continue. Um, funding can also be challenging. Um, and there's always language barriers. Um, 
uh, not only like language in terms of, uh, of speaking languages, but also like uh, learning the programming languages, um, I think say that. Um, and also cultural barriers. Um, um, so like I said in 2017, BioC, that's when the concept of this community got started. And Alejandro Reyes, who's also here and a co-founding member of CDSB, he made this little uh, uh, map of the uh, um, location of bioconductor contributors back then. And um, really there was none really from, there's no one from Mexico and many other parts of the world, right? So what we're experiencing uh, in our own local community is um, actually shared uh, in many other places. Um, so we wanted to increase um, the representation of Latin Americans at BioC and other our conferences. Now, at the same time, while we're thinking this, people in Mexico have been organizing bioinformatics uh, workshops. Um, uh, initially, the first one was 2006, and then after a four year hit, um, break, they started organizing them every two years, 2010, 2012, 2014, et cetera. Um, and so they had a lot of the know-how and the infrastructure for organizing uh, workshops in Mexico. And so it was very natural for us to team up with them and to start organizing workshops. So that's what we did in 2018, 19, and then 2020 now. Um, and so from our perspective, uh, we are really interested in facilitating the uh, transition from our user to our developer. And we want to enable that step in Latin America and Mexico. Um, the workshops organized by uh, the team in Mexico was a lot about getting people from transition from the level of being interested into being users. Uh, but after several years of training users, um, some of the users were raising their hands and asking like, how can we keep advancing, right? So that's where um, we come in. And we're not alone. We have a, a support network. Um, otherwise, this would not be feasible. And so uh, we try to take advice and ideas from many different uh, communities um, built around R, so, such as, I mean, Bioconductor is uh, the main one, but we also take ideas from R Open Sci. Um, we take teaching materials from both um, our student Bioconductor. I mean, we don't, we don't just take it, we like ask for permission and like um, check the licenses and all of that. Um, and we borrow community building activities and ideas on how to do that. Um, we also benefit by having volunteer instructors from both, let's say our ladies, our bioconductor volunteer and help us teach because we don't have any funding to pay people for teaching. Um, now we also um, uh, uh, rely on our network for funding opportunities and most of all for visibility, right? Um, uh, like who's going to believe in just like two or three people we need a couple other more people to help us spread the word and get things started um something that is really challenging is also going and ask for help right and um and so this is um alejandro and me back in, in new york last year talking to marty morgan and asking for help and that's something that is uh, not easy to do um uh, but um and i don't I mean, I don't know why it is so hard, but, uh, but it is really rewarding because people on the other side are really eager to help. Um, and you have to overcome a lot of, you know, being, feeling shy and a lot of barriers um, just to uh, ask for help. Um, now, even though we have a lot of, you know, uh, great interest in building these communities in Mexico and, and, and spreading the word, um, there's a lot of things that we don't know. Uh, and some of us don't even live in Mexico now. Uh, and so that's why we needed also a local support network. And this, in our case, is uh, uh, composed by two organizations. Um, really one of them is the academic side, uh, which is the National Bioinformatics Node at the National University of Mexico. Um, but in order for them to manage money for conferences and things like that, they had to create um, a, a society called the Mexican Bioinformatics Network that is a nonprofit society uh, in Mexican legal, um, their legal finance system. And they're the ones that are able to take in all the sponsorship money and manage it and organize um, how to spend it. And so they have a lot of experience 
organizing these workshops, like dealing with the local payment uh, from, uh, from students, uh, the legal body and bank accounts. They also have access to the classroom infrastructure. And so that's where the Center for Genomic Sciences and the undergrad for Genomic Sciences comes in because they have um, a couple of classrooms that we can use with computers. Um, provide with, like all the official letters, reservations, and managing like hotels and stuff for guests, um, access to the teaching assistants, and many other um, you know local needs. And basically, they also have access to the local community, and so they're able to identify what they are um, interested in learning. So without them, that wouldn't be possible. And um, and our CDSB founding members, well, some of us more from the R and Bioconductor side, some also more on the local side, like Delfino and Eladia, that had, been, uh, had experience organizing these workshops in Mexico. Um, we view ourselves as a virtual university department. We want to uh, provide a location for uh, 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 having discussion of ideas, exchanging um, also ideas and ex expertise, uh, and removing barriers. That's really one of the key things. And that also actually translates to sometimes pushing people. So being kind of like um, a cheerleader and saying like, we, uh, I believe in you, you should believe in yourself because I believe in you. Um, um, you're definitely, you definitely have the talent, you just need to raise your hand and, and ask for a scholarship or uh, X or Y opportunity. Um, and so we have our little website here. Um, and our 2018 event was our kickstarting event. Um, and we were trying to teach how to you know, do reproducible data science with R and Biconductor um, and how to transition from being a user into a developer. So we had some uh, lectures on uh, developing packages and, uh, and different activities related to that. Um, and our idea back then in 2018 was like, okay, well, let's do this once, see if, see if it works out and maybe we can continue do, to do it in the future. Um, and so for 2018, we, I mean, we also are very conscious about diversity. And so we reached out to uh, people outside the National University of Mexico in other Mexican institutions. Uh, and, and also, for example, Maria Teresa from Our Ladies Mexico City helped us. But we have people from other like research institutions, research institutions in Mexico. And Benelton, who had experience running something similar in Brazil. Um, several years prior to this. Um, after that, the Bioconductor 2019 um, scholarship application assistance that we provided was really, really opened this path for having people from Mexico attend the Bioconductor Conference in New York. And that's really important because it opens a lot of opportunities um, uh, by networking, by increasing visibility, and also motivating people um, to then contribute back to their local communities because that might increase their odds of being of winning an, um, a travel scholarship for BioC or other conferences. Um, so this is us in New York uh, um, practicing Jocelyn's presentation um, um, just um, before um, um, she presented that day uh, with also uh, a CDSB member. Um, uh, Pedro, um, who um, is in New York um, and was able to attend the conference. So Jocelyn and Anna uh, presented at that conference their work. And so that was really um, uh, a prideful moment to see this in action uh, because just two years later, Alejandro and I were looking at each other by C2017 and asking how can we increase the participation of Latin Americans in Bioconductor. And this, this was it for us, right? Even if it was just three presenters. Um, and so that, like I said, attending these conferences is a great networking opportunity to learn from others, meet potential instructors. We can also ask for support, um, um, guidance from stars in the field like Robert, uh, gentlemen. And then we made a, a lot of effort to make sure that all the newcomers were included. Um, because it, it, it is awful when you go to a conference and uh, you don't know anyone. So we, we made sure to introduce people. Um, and so until 2019, our board member was us, uh, really us four. Um, uh, although here we're talking to Martin. Um, but there's a problem also of sustainability. Like I mentioned, these efforts are really uh, 
dependent on the volunteers that run it. And so um, on this blog post on our consortium, I mentioned that time will tell if our efforts create a ripple that grew into a wave or if we ended up burning out. And so one solution to avoid repeating our mistakes from the past that we did maybe in 28, 29, 2009, um, is to bring in new volunteers. And so Jocelyn Chavez is um, a CDSB 2018 and 2019 alumni, but she joined our board in 2019, co-founded the Our Ladies Cornavaca, and is now also gonna be an instructor of the 2020 workshop. So this is like, our like uh, superstar example of someone that learned from us and now is um, working with us to teach more people. Um, we now have a YouTube channel that uh, Jocelyn uh, created for us uh, that has um, just uh, some videos that we, uh, from a session we ran about two weeks ago and that is gonna have the videos from our 2020 summer workshop. So what do we do? We run workshops, but we also have Slack, which is, serves as a virtual department. Uh, we encourage members to apply to opportunities and we guide them on the process. Um, it can be English um, guidance. It could also be like, oh, maybe um, mentorship guidance of like, oh, you should like try to mention this or that about you know, what you do because that's gonna increase your odds of winning. Um, um, we train others um, and some of them, some of the people we train might join us to, keep, to help us train more people. We uh, spend a lot of time adapting ideas from others, trying to learn the best practices and, uh, and borrowing as much as we can, because uh, uh, otherwise uh, our efforts wouldn't be possible. And we try to promote work by both our members, but also our allies. There's a lot of things that we would like to do uh, potentially better or more. Uh, one of them is like reaching out to potential sponsors. Uh, so um, I need to learn how to do this better, maybe through a bio C. Um, we just started some community calls and, and mini courses uh, in, in the beginning of July. And uh, something that is tricky for us is that our audience is really bi um, biology students that have interest in learning bioinformatics. So it's hard for us to balance that, you know, being biology focused but with the, the side of art development. So last year, our, um, our workshop was really focused on art development. Um, and so we had a, a lower attendance than we anticipated. Uh, and that's maybe uh, we need to work on how to improve that balance. Um, um, next, uh, we want to also promote more contributions from our members on our blog. Potentially uh, uh, serve more as a liaison for uh, career opportunities to our members, um, and they could come from outside Mexico. Although right now with the pandemic, it's hard. Um, and we want to reach beyond Mexico. Uh, we have a lot of local support, and that's why it's easy for us to run, or it's a lot easier for us to run our events in Mexico. Um, there's people from outside Mexico that attend those events, but uh, but they, I mean, they need to travel to Mexico. Uh, uh, and while we know people outside of Mexico and Latin America, we haven't uh, really um, um, spent too much time trying to go beyond Mexico. We also want to build some capacity, and that means like training more instructors, instructors and teaching assistants, because they might start, start as teaching assistants and then grow up, um, uh, gain experience, and, um, and become instructors too. Uh, um, we're considering having a paid Slack workspace because we're about to reach that 10,000 message limit. Um, and our goal that we stated to Martin last year is to uh, organize a BIOC conference. Um, at the time we said maybe within the uh, next five years. Um, and so for that, we really need that wave to grow. Um, um, Martin advises that we needed to like create more int local interest, maybe have more, um, local PIs uh, buying to buy conductor. And so we're in that process um, and may maybe we'll organize uh, a larger conference um, sometime down the road. And so we're really excited. This is our picture from 2019. Um, we're really excited about the future. Um, in particular, we're running our third workshop in next week, um, which is gonna be a mix now of using materials from our studio and bioconductor. conductor. 
So we're, we're going to use materials from a workshop from the RC2 conference in 2020, and also materials from the um, orchestrating single cell analysis with Bioconductor book, uh, and slides from Peter Hickey, um, who's going to teach one of the workshops soon. Um, so that's where we're going to teach. And we're also really happy that Marcel Ramos from the Bioconductor core team uh, volunteered to help us teach part of this uh, workshop. Um, for BioC 2020, uh, I'm, even though we're not in person, right, we're doing this virtually, I'm really excited to see so many faces uh, from Latin Americans at the conference. And this is just the ones that are part of CDSB. There's more um, that are not uh, uh, members of our community. Um, uh, but um, on this Twitter thread, I try to highlight all of them and I would really appreciate if you helped us increase uh, our visibility uh, through this um, Twitter link. Uh, you can read all the stories and um, help us share them. So with that, um, we're gonna um, transition to the Regu Tools portion of the Spurs of a Feather that is gonna be presented by Carmina, Jesus, Emiliano, or Emmy, and Jocelyn Chavez. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Leo, for the presentation. Yes. So uh, I'm going to start to present uh, what is uh, Regula. Le Le tools. Yeah, here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, Leo has been talking about this package that we developed that it's called Regula tools. But what is Regula tools? Regula tools is an R package that serve, serve as a bridge between the database uh, Regulon and the bioconductor environment. So the Regu tools uh, package allows us to extract and in a systematic way the information from the Regulon DB database. So if we go to the next um, slide. Yeah. So what is a Regulon DB? Regulon DB is a transcriptional regulatory and transcriptional networks uh, stored in equally. And they have been done an incredible job collecting, harmonizing, and centralizing the information about the regulation in E. coli. And so when we present to them, they, they tell that they want to build an, a package. And why do they need a package? Because they want to facilitate the programmatic access to Regulon DB. And they want to have an integration with the downstream analysis that were done in in a majority of the cases with the bioconductor tools. And also they want to improve the reproducibility of this um, analysis. So if we go to the next, yeah. So how everything starts. So this is start and actually on the rate project from the, on the rate genomic project uh, where Leo and Alejandro are uh, from also. And Emiliano and I together with uh, Jose Alquisira um, start this, this project. So they we go to the lab and they told us that oh, we need a we want an R package and they told us uh, the motivation that I just showed. So we start to think and so we, we have the database, we have the requirements, we, we start to, to think what do they need, uh, what kind of functions are going to be useful, uh, what do the user need, uh, how can we do make this easy for not expert uh, in programming uh, users. So after one year of work, we got the functions. We were really happy. We got a version of the database in SQLite, but we still didn't have the package. And we were like in the movie of Nemo, like in the ocean, like with the functions. And we were like, now what? Uh, what are we supposed to do? We know that a package has functions, they work, we believe that they work, uh, so we were kind of lo lost. And this is where the community uh, come as serves really as a catalysis and help us to make the ring true and have the, the package. So Emiliano and I, when we finish uh, this project after this year, Emiliano and I and others, uh, we have the function and the database. But uh, in one of these workshops that Emiliano attend, he met uh, Jocelyn, Leo, and Alejandro. And so they, we, we start to work on the, um, on the package and they start to teach us because I think that's really important. It's not that they took the package and they do the things, the magic thing that, that we didn't know how to do 
and they and they say, oh, here is. No, they really teach us how to do it. And they say, oh, you have to do the test. These are important for this. This is how you do it. So now, uh, after all this help, we have the, an improvement on the functions. We have a documentation. We have the vignette. We have a lot of tests. Uh, we have 97% of the code test, and we're really proud of that. And we have also an integrated uh, workflow uh, of the um, of how to use uh, the package. And now Emiliano is going to explain us a little more about how is the um, actual package. Yeah. Okay. So hi everyone. So as Carmina said, we're going to tell you a bit more about the package itself. And so, well, first of all, we are distributing the uh, regular DB uh, SQLite version of the database. Uh, through a notation hub. And so, well, the package itself has functions for doing queries to the database and also to convert uh, some of the information to uh, bioconductors uh, objects like G ranges. And also, we provide some functions for vis visualizing the results. And Regu Tools is now available in Bioconductor. So, um, next uh, slide, please. Right, so to start querying uh, with RegulTools, first we have to, to build a Regulon DB object. And so the Regulon DB class is an S4 class that um, extends on the SQLite connection class, but we added some slots for keeping track of the database version and also the organization version because in the future we might distribute more than one um, version of the database. And um, next slide, please. Right, so once we have our regular DB object, we can use the, the get data set function to do the actual querying. So uh, you need to pass the regular DB object to the function and select a data set. In this example, we're selecting the data set gene but there are other data sets available in the database such as transcription factor or promoters. And so uh, you can also select some attributes. So in this case, we are uh, retrieving the genomic position of some genes. And you can also use this function to filter. So you can provide the filters uh, as a names list where the uh, the filtering attribute is the name of the element of a list and then a vector with the values. And so the result of this function is a regular DB result object, which is a data frame containing the results of the query, but also keeping track of the metadata from the, uh, the information with the database. And we, we also have some functions to, to list what are the gene, what are the data sets and attributes available. And once we have our, our regular DB uh, result object, one thing you might want to do is, for example, if you have information about uh, the genomic coordinates, you can convert this object to IG ranges so that you can use a downstream bioconductor applications. Or for example, if you have a, a DNA sequence uh, information in the result, you can also, um, you can also convert it to a B-strings object. So um, now Jocelyn is going to tell you a bit more about specific queries that are common to regular DB that we implemented as functions. Thank you, Emiliano. Um, and hi, everyone. So one of the more uh, useful things that you can do uh, with Rogu Tools is to extract and visualize regulatory networks. So we created a function that is called get gene regulators and you need to provide the database that we are working on and the gene names that uh, we are interested. Uh, so this function retrieves all the regulators that controls uh, these genes and the effect over them, uh, either if they are an activator, a repressor or a dual function. And also we integrated the package CY3 to connect, to, uh, to connect with Cyberscape and have a representation of these networks uh, with the function that is called plot gene regulators. And we observe the proteins that act as a regulator in the nodes 
and all the genes regulated around the regulator. Also, we have the connections between them uh, with differential colors. Uh, next slide, please. And another uh, beautiful thing is to represent all the genomic elements located within a, a specific genomic uh, range. Uh, so we created this function that is called get DNA objects. And by default, this function only retrieves the genes, but you can choose from a large uh, list from uh, genomic elements, uh, such as promoters, terminators, or uh, regulatory binding sites. So uh, you can uh, get all of these elements in a table or data frame uh, format, but also you can uh, visualize all of these genomic elements thanks to uh, the integration with some functions from the GBIS package. So you can observe all of uh, these uh, genomic elements in a genome browser-like uh, plot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is, these are the most common and uh, used functions from RegoTools, but all of this work uh, doesn't stop here. So for the future, we plan to uh, launch the multi-organism version because in the present, RegulonDB, the, uh, the database RegulonDB only have information about Escherichia coli, but uh, we want to launch uh, more organisms. So as you can imagine, this represents a lot of work. So we, we don't have a, a date, a specific date, but uh, the RegulonDB team is working hard to have uh, the multi-organism version as soon as possible. And thanks to the design of the regular DB object, we have the facility to specify the organism that we are working with. So we hope that this design uh, help us to uh, uh, integrate the multi-organism version in a, a smooth way. Uh, next slide. And um, uh, we don't only uh, submitted this, this package to Bioconductor, but also wanted to share all the uh, Regu tools uh, as a net, uh, all the Regu tools application as the complete uh, network, uh, um, sorry, as a complete um, um, set uh, of us uh, or, or steps. So uh, we created a manuscript we, uh, re that was recently uh, published and that shows all the tools uh, facilities uh, for programmatic access in bacterial and bacterial regulatory networks uh, next slide so now I hand over Alejandro to continue with the discussion and the Q&A section thank you Jocelyn and thank you to all the presenters I think um, this was a great overview of uh, uh, first the uh, ideas that uh, Maybe Leo and I were talking uh, at a bar a couple of, of a couple of years ago, and uh, and I think Leo just gave like a very good overview of uh, sort of our efforts to make these ideas into something, um, into concrete uh, goals, and and some of them have been achieved, and where we're we going to move to the future. Uh, and thank you, uh, Emil, uh, Emiliano, Carmina, and Jocelyn for the nice presentation and for your great work on the on the package. Um, I see that uh, there are a couple of questions that uh, I sort of would like to divide into two. Uh, there is one technical question about the Regulun uh, Regul Tools package that maybe we can answer, and maybe we can uh, a little bit open the discussion to um, uh, to uh, like the, the the community part of this discussion of um, sort of like uh, our future goals, etc., and other and other questions that are there, and maybe also to and discuss how our efforts or how can we be of help to people trying to replicate a similar model in other geographic areas of the world. So first, the technical question. Uh, after uploading the SQL database, uh, are the results formatted as data frames or as data tables? Um, does anyone want to take that, Jocelyn, Emiliano, or Carmina? Because Okay, I take this one. Um, okay. So the regulon, uh, the the package regul tools by default tries to uh, 
have the outputs as a regular DB object that maintains all the information uh, or the metadata from the database, but uh, it can be uh, converted and uh, it's important to say that this object is an S4 object, so uh, you can uh, access more likely like a data frame object. So yes, I, uh, it's more like a data frame. And another technical question is, uh, how many species are you planning to expand? As many as possible. <laughs> Uh, I think that for the moment, uh, the Regulon DB team is considering three more species from bacteria, but uh, uh, I hope that it could be more in the future. I think also to add on Jocelyn's answer, I think uh, part of the work that Regu Tools does is take uh, a, a database that is built by another team. And building this database, uh, it's very, very, it's a lot, a lot of work. It's something that has been done for the last 20 years. And it involves a lot of manual curation of data, um, uh, really like curators reading papers and, and determining what are the regulators of what gene regulates what gene, et cetera. Um, so in a way, I think the Regu tools is, is one, as we describe it in the presentation, is like a bridge uh, between that, that database that has a lot of knowledge with uh, modern uh, data structures and uh, all the uh, statistical tools available in Bioconductor. Um, so it, 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 to, to make that bridge, we really need a, a database first to be built. And I know there are some uh, uh, people working in, in Regulon DB in the conference, so maybe um, they, uh, they, they, they will give more insights uh, in the, in, during the conference. So maybe with this, um, I would like to open the discussion on the sort of like community part by first saying an anecdote um, and then um, also like a sort of like a comment, which uh, I think they're through, through the, way, the, the way I'm describing them, they're sort of, they're, they're going to be converted into suggestions for the community advisory meeting. So in, I think a little bit more than one year and a half, uh, after we organized our first workshop and the um, scholarship application for the bioconductor meeting in New York opened, we, Leo and I were discussing how to engage people, how to encourage people to apply um, to these conferences, so, so to, to this scholarship. So we sent um, a couple of messages encouraging people that if, uh, if the saying if, if they were interested in going to the conference and they have uh, a good software package to present uh, that the application is open. But what really worked better, I think, was to email directly people. And uh, first, like browsing GitHub uh, pages of our alumni from the first workshop and looking at those uh, uh, people that had really followed up on their code and that have uh, other code, uh, like they they were starting organizing their code into R packages and things like that, and just contact them directly, saying, uh, "Look, we 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 know that you have been developing R packages. We're really happy that our uh, our workshop was useful. There is this opportunity to present to to apply for a scholarship to go to go to a bio bioconductor meeting in New York, and we think you have um, um, a very good chance of getting this scholarship." And um, to me, it was surprising that uh, we sent uh, a couple of these, uh, of these emails. Three people got back and were interested. Uh, we uh, did a couple of back and forth between uh, Leo and I giving feedback on the applications. And at the end, um, out of the three people that ended up submitting the applications, all of them got the scholarship. So sort of one lesson that we got from this experience is that maybe people that have the right talent and skills uh, to contribute to the project, do not apply uh, to these applications because uh, they, they don't even think about applying. And it, it sort of like this push of uh, encouraging him to apply, it's, uh, it's, it's an, at the end an email that maybe takes five minutes, but it's like a, a, an active thing that you are telling people to apply. Um, and I guess the reason why I'm telling this anecdote and the, the, the reason why I want to convert this into sort of a, a, a suggestion for the advisory 
community advisory uh, committee is that perhaps it could be open calls for scholarships uh, uh, encouraging specific underrepresented groups uh, to apply for this, this kind of uh, scholarships. Um, I think, I know this is this has been a successful model, for example, in the R Studio conferences, and because it, it really delivers a message uh, to people that they don't even consider applying for these scholarships. Uh, and this, this message is, please apply. And, uh, and, and I think that's a win for all. all. One of the cases that I described uh, of one of these uh, sort of like successful applications was Jocelyn. And that has been a win-win for everyone because uh, the Bioconductor project uh, is winning a very good developer. And I know that Jocelyn has another poster, so she, 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 she has been actively developing packages. And of course, it, it, it helps to solve the problem of diversity. Um, so the second comment has to do with uh, this specific conference. I think this has been the conference in which um, there is a lot of representation from many different geographic areas. Um, for example, I know that there are, there are a lot of people from Mexico. Um, so we are sort of like growing in, into the, um, in our representation in the bioconductor meetings. And I think one reason for this is because um, the registration costs are lower. And the, the fact that it's a virtual conference, people don't need to pay for um, accommodation and travels. Um, and I think this opens a very big uh, door for maybe universities or, or labs that do not have the funding to, 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 to travel. So I, I, that's something that I think um, um, the community advisory committee could consider is to maybe in the future meetings, where hopefully uh, we can get to meet in person uh, to, keep, to also leave this uh, door open to uh, us of the sort of like the virtual aspect of it, of maybe live streaming uh, the uh, workshops or, or, or other network opportunities. And I think that would open the door to many people that perhaps do not have the, the, the funding to go to these conferences and make the, the project even, uh, even more accessible to everyone. Um, so, with this ranting from my side, I'm gonna stop here and maybe we can go through the questions that are in the poll. Um, the first one is, uh, is the CDSB conducted in Spanish? What would you do if speakers of different languages participated in terms of uh, auto-translator, auto-caption, etc.? cetera? Yeah, so I'll answer that one. Um, mm -hmm. So, 2018, the material was taught in English. 2019 and 2020, the material is going to be taught in Spanish. Um, we make a, uh, a lot of effort in making sure that the full website is available in both languages. Why? Because um, people in Mexico might not know English uh, or Latin America. Um, and so they want to maybe read in Spanish. But then also uh, we're uh, fighting for visibility. And so uh, that involves having material in English. Uh, otherwise, other uh, people won't share um, um, your events. Um, now for actually teaching, uh, the CBSB events are open to anyone. And uh, if anyone registers that only speaks English, we, have, we teach in English um, with maybe slides in Spanish. Uh, or, or, or a mix of them. Um, uh, in the past, when we uh, taught in English, uh, the breaks were also useful to sometimes uh, answer any um, English-related questions. A lot of people in Mexico actually um, speak English, but they um, you know, at different levels of it. Um, and so this is this is a really complicated um, component because. Um, there's no great answer. Um, uh, ideally, we would have maybe more uh, Spanish speaking um, um, uh, instructors, but we also have to grasp the reality where like uh, a lot of great instructors don't know Spanish, right? And so we try to balance both languages as much as we can. And we don't, we, we've never, I never thought about an auto translator or auto caption, uh, but that's um, a good idea to think about. Yep. Thanks, Leo. And I think a very important question. 
uh, for other Latin American scientists uh, how to join the organization. So we are open to anyone actually. Um, so you might not notice from the pictures, but Stephanie here um, is based in Switzerland and she's from Colombia. Um, and so she approached us asking like, hey, I've heard about your events, kind of learn from you, maybe uh, we can do this also in Colombia. And so we're really happy to have her with us and, uh, and we try to do the same with other people. Um, um, and uh, we actually participated in a recent Use R 2020 um, uh, session with other Latin Americans from many other organizations. So um, yes, if you want to join us, just let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll add you. And you don't have to be Latin American either. We have non-Latin Americans. Yes, and, and I think to add on top of that, I think that um, a lot of times helps uh, the community because um, when more experts join, when, when we are more people, maybe somebody has a question. Um, it is, it is, it, 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 like, this is of course, as, as Leo were mentioning, everyone is a volunteer of uh, answering questions, et cetera, or even contributing to projects, uh, mentoring people, et cetera. If more people are interested in, in, in doing this, uh, and especially people that are perhaps uh, that have uh, that speak Spanish and are uh, sort of like this bar language barrier is is is, is uh, lower, uh, that that's even better for us. It's we're really open to everyone, as Leo was uh, was saying. Um, Here's an of the question. I'm sorry. I'm just showing on um, uh, from our Slack like an example question. Yeah. Many people might know the answer to that. Uh, yeah. That's a part of the control <laughs> department. Yes. <laughs> um, I guess there was another, there were two other questions. Let me check. Um, is, having conference, is, is having conference online helpful to your cost since it's lower barrier of cost? Yes, uh, definitely. And this is something that I tried to say also a little bit before, I think having this uh, door open of having the virtual meeting. It's something that is very, very helpful for uh, um, a lot of us, in, in, including universities that perhaps uh, have very restri restricted budgets. So this is, um, yeah, in the, in the future, I think it would be great to have both the physical meeting, because I think it's also important if the sort of like the, the, the in-person component uh, but also uh, to have this additional challenge of um, channel of, of of having the virtual uh, sessions open. Um, That's because like three hundred dollars plus hotels plus flights is really cost prohibitive for most people. And then even with the BIOC twenty nineteen travel scholarships that cover the um, registration and hotel for two or three nights and flight, um, people, the people that went had to ask for more scholarships from Mexico to pay the rest, to pay food, to pay like other uh, transportation costs. So that's why um, like having three people last year attend by a C 2019 was a huge win. It was, um, uh, yeah, it was really hard. Yeah, maybe I will add another comment, but actually to the previous question of uh, how do you do join the organization? I think the, the easiest way to start uh, approaching uh, all of us is to uh, join the Slack channel. And uh, uh, I think we have the link to the Slack in the web page, right, Leo? Um, I'm not, I might have to add it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 ways you can contact us. Yeah, yeah. We're also very active on social media. So any, any, any channel, uh, that uh, uh, we get reached at, I think, uh, that should do the job. And th I was leaving one question at the end because I think it's the hardest one, uh, which is, what are your expectations for the next five years with the great project that you have started? And I think, I mean, um, the way we see this is, uh, I think Leo, Leo projected what uh, one goal of maybe uh, having local bioconductor meetings and organizing bioc conferences. 
Uh, so I think our goal right now is to really increase the mass of developers um, from, uh, uh, in our specific case, um, uh, Mexico and Latin America. Um, uh, and I think perhaps a longer term goal is that um, our efforts and our uh, community is taken as an example uh, for other people wanting to do something similar uh, to take it as sort of like a, 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 a good example of how to do things. Um, so we are in this process, this process of, of trying to spread the word, uh, uh, generating more uh, uh, developers, like, uh, yeah, encouraging more developers locally. I don't know, if, Leo, if you want to add something in the last 45 seconds before the session is over. I mean, I think the first goal is to survive, right? <laughs> Uh, but yes, like the grand goal is to have a conference um, and um, and to grow more, uh, you know, train more instructors, teaching assistants, provide opportunities for other people. Um, um, so yeah, those are our goals. Um, and then I don't know if we can end with just, uh, we had some questions for, um, for Jocelyn, Carmina, and Emiliano. I don't know if we can just mention those quickly. Um, I think we're out of time, okay. but um, but yes. Um, Maybe we could do it as a blog post then. Yeah, sounds good. So thank you, thank you everyone for attending uh, this meeting and there's a question the rest from of the conference. AD. There's a question from Aiden. So I couldn't manage to do the poll thing. I managed to close down the website and get myself confused. Um, what I was wondering was, do you have access to maybe a list of people that are developing bioconductor packages in bioconductor? So one of the things that I found, I wanted to try and find the people in Boston that were developing packages and it wasn't so easy to track people's affiliations in, 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 in submitted packages. Can you access that information? Is that available? If you wanted to pull out like who's developing bioconductor packages in Mexico, have you got that information? Mm. We have not. I mean, the, the, we, we tried to do that, um, I think two years ago, uh, but through the submissions that are, uh, like the, the, the bioconductor packages that are submitted through GitHub. But even then it was very, very difficult because not all the people have their affiliations on their GitHub uh, profiles. So I don't think we have a good solution for that. I, th I think it's, it's, it's for these kind of um, projects where we're trying to reach out, we kind of need to have a way to find out people's affiliations or maybe just their interests in different groups. I think it may help to build community because there could be many more people that maybe that might be good resources in your community. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 I fully agree. Yeah, I mean, the our consortium blog post in February, I think helped us. Um, I mean, we try to blog about it, share it on our weekly, um, our bloggers everywhere. Right? So that's how we're trying to meet people, but it's uh, social media, but, um, but we don't have a direct way. Yeah. So okay. I guess we should end it. Thank you very much for uh, for joining us today. And uh, uh, also something key that I think Alejandro mentioned is that uh, we're more than happy to share our experience with other people if you want to start something similar in your own local communities. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.